Hey, good morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. If we have not met before, question, is anyone jumping on a plane later today? Got to go on a business trip or heading out of town. Anybody doing that? Anybody getting on a plane later this week? Anybody got to get on a plane? Okay, I see a few hands. Anybody ever been on a plane? Okay, we're all in the same boat here. Just wanted to get us all in because you've probably been on a plane. You've been in an airport, especially if you've flown out of Chattanooga. You know you've got to connect somewhere. You've got connections that you've got to make. And you've probably experienced what it's like when there are flight cancellations. Ooh, somebody's like, oh, flight delays, you know. You're wondering if you're going to make your connection, if you're going to make the meeting or the event, the wedding, whatever it may be. I have seen people break down, grown men and women break down into tears in airport terminals because of this. There's a story about a scene that happened in an airport, probably like you've been in before, where a sudden storm had come in that nobody was prepared for, but it was starting to knock out uh, different flights, canceling connections. People were starting to panic frantically, wondering if they're going to make it home, wondering if they're going to get where they need to go. And the, the, the terminal wasn't ready for it. The gate agents, there weren't enough of them to handle the crowds. And so in this one particular gate, there was this one particular gate agent frantically trying to get people rebooked and on different flights and on the flight that's about to leave right behind them. And, and the crowd is gathering, the mob is forming, and there is this line of people at her desk when all of a sudden a gentleman who must have just reached his threshold of frustration stepped out of the line walked up to the counter, slammed his boarding pass, and said, I must be on this flight, and it has to be first class. And the gate agent was kind of like, whoa. And he just said calmly, sir, I, I understand there are a lot of people who are in your same situation. I'm trying to help them in the order that they come from. If you'll just go back and get in line, I'll try to help you as soon as possible. Well, this just did not satisfy this man. He looked right back at her, banged his fist on the counter and said, do you have any idea who I am? The gate agent kind of looked and studied his face and then reached for the intercom that would page the whole gate area. So ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We have a passenger here who does not know who he is. If anyone could help him find his identity, please come to gate 21. The man is stunned. The crowd erupts into applause and justice was served, right? You've all been there. I don't know who that guy was, whether he was rich or famous Maybe he held some high position, but you know what? Nobody else in that gate cared because it's hard to care for someone or respect someone or honor someone who thinks they're the most important person in the room, who puts his or her needs ahead of everyone else. And don't you know somebody like that? Perhaps at school, at work, a teenager at home. What about you and me, though? Have you ever had a thought? Like, I'm not going to do that. Or, no one's going to tell me what to do. No one appreciates what I do around here. That's not my job. There's a mentality there that can threaten our relationships. It can threaten our career. It can even threaten our relationship with God. But there is a better way. Last week, Chris, in our series, Life Together, was talking about grace. Being people who who have received grace and then turn around and extend grace. We defined it as undeserved favor, one-sided love. And we're to take this doctrine, this, this thing that we believe about God, and, and trust it. 
stake our entire lives on it, and then live it out as an expression of that belief. Life together. We're trying to create a culture here, a gospel culture that flows out of a gospel doctrine. Let me define that because that can sound a little bit academic. And I'm going to quote an essay by a man named Roy Ortland, who is an author and a pastor in Nashville. He writes this about this idea. So what is gospel doctrine? And if you've got a bulletin and you take notes, you might want to take some notes here. You might even want to jot down that highlighted part there on the screen. What is gospel doctrine? What do I mean by that? Well, I mean the biblical message, what the Bible teaches, of divine grace for the undeserving. God, through the perfect life, atoning death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus, rescues all his people from the wrath of God into peace with God, with the promise of full restoration of his created order forever, all to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's doctrine. That's teaching. That's the gospel. So what is gospel culture? Well, gospel culture is the shared experience of grace for the undeserving. In other words, it's what we get to share together and what that looks like as we share it. Listen to this. It's the corporate incarnation or like, you know, the family embodiment of the biblical message in relationships, vibe, feel, tone, values, priorities, aroma, honesty, freedom, gentleness, humility, cheerfulness, indeed the total human reality of a church defined and sweetened by the gospel. How beautiful is that? I love that. What we believe, the doctrine, should flow out of us in into our culture as we do life together. And that culture, as we're talking about it over these next several weeks, is what's going to make us different or distinct from the rest of the world. The reality is the culture in a church like this one, a church of, that's centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ, it should look different. We should look different. And we live in a top-down world. Like we live in an upward-advancing world. We live in an entitled world. But the gospel says something completely different. The apostle Paul said it like this in his letter to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do nothing out of rivalry, or that could be translated selfish ambition. And don't do anything out of conceit, or in other words, your own pride or your own narcissism. Paul's trying to get us to think about others as more significant than ourselves, and that's gospel culture. That's the shared experience of grace. That's how we live according to the gospel. But we should know where that's coming from. Like, what's that anchored in? What's the belief that we have that, that anchors that culture? Otherwise, that's just a good idea. I mean, that's just a neat core value. It would probably look good on a T-shirt. Maybe someone would even like to join the organization because of that. Here's the gospel doctrine. Here's why Paul would tell us to live that way. He says it later on in Philippians 2. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ 
is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's the gospel right there. See, that's the gospel doctrine, looking at what Jesus did. When When the world's climbing up the ladder, Jesus is stepping down out of heaven. When the world is competing, Jesus is submitting. He takes off his heavenly robes, as it were, and he takes on the form of a servant. And there's a powerful scene in which we see this play out in real time. It's found in the Gospel of John, if you want to turn in your Bible there, or open that up on your smartphone. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John's the fourth book in the New Testament. We're going to be in John chapter 13, and if you don't have any way to read that, we'll have it on the screen for you. The Apostle John writes this. Now, before the feast of the Passover, so John's setting a scene for us. There's something happening here that's a pretty significant deal. And if you don't remember the Passover, this was a feast that that Jewish people celebrated. They'd been celebrating it for centuries. It looks back on this event that took place in the book of Exodus. You find it there in your Old Testament when God's people, the Hebrew people, were enslaved in Egypt. And they're crying out to God, and God hears their cries, and, and he says, it's, it's, en- it's time. Enough is enough. After 400 years of slavery, he's going to release his people. So he sends these plagues on Egypt. You may remember this story, you know, the, all these different plagues getting, trying to get Pharaoh to let God's people go, and he would not relent. He would not submit. And finally, God sends the hammer down. And God kills the firstborn sons of all the Egyptians. And in order for God's people to be protected and spared, God told them to take a lamb and to sacrifice it, to take the blood of that lamb and to to put it over the doorpost of your home so that when death came through that night, it would pass over them, sparing them. And that night as that happened, As you could hear the cries and the wails of the Egyptians as they realized what has taken place, God's people are liberated. That is what's being celebrated right now in this scene. John says, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, meaning it's about time for God's plan to be fulfilled here, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse two, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. So here's here's this scene. It's It's just before Passover. It's Thursday night. In less than 24 hours, Jesus is going to be brutally crucified. So he's gathered his disciples together like a final meal together. What's going through Jesus' mind right now? I mean, what would be going through your mind if you knew that tomorrow was your last day? That this might be your last meal with those you love? What would you want to say to them? Well, John actually fills us in that something dawns on Jesus. He's suddenly aware of something. In this moment, as the guys are hanging out and they're talking and the meal is being served, Jesus is overwhelmed with these thoughts. And we can see this in these verses. In verse 1 of chapter 13, we know, or he knows, he's going to die. And then he's going to return to the Father. In verse 3, we're told that Jesus knows that all things have been given to him, which means he has all the authority and power in the world. And he knows that not only did he come from God, but he was going back to God. So here's what Jesus knew. He knew his origin. He came from God. He knew his authority. He's the most important guy in the room right now. Not just the room, but the city of Jerusalem, the Roman Empire, planet Earth, the cosmos. And he knew his destiny. He was going to die. 
and he was going to go be with the Father in heaven. And here's what else he knew. He knew he loves these guys. And why is all that so important? Why is what Jesus knows so important? It's because out of this knowledge, these things that he knows, out of this love that he has for these guys, Jesus is about to act. He's about to do something. So think about gospel doctrine, gospel culture, gospel belief, what we, what we know, what we think and, and believe, and how that informs how we live. That's what's happening right here. Verse 4. So, Jesus, knowing where he came from, Jesus knowing he's the most powerful dude at dinner, Jesus knowing he's going back to God very soon, what would he do with that? He got up from the meal. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, unless you grew up in first century Palestine, the significance here is probably lost on us. So let's start with the fact that in verse for the meal is already underway when Jesus gets up from the table to start washing feet. See, foot washing was something that should have happened before dinner ever began. It actually should have happened as soon as the guests entered the home. And it wasn't just like a customary thing. It was a necessary thing. I mean, just think about it. They're walking around the streets. The streets are dirty. They're dusty, all kinds of trash and garbage, animals, you know, everywhere, walking through all that stuff. They weren't wearing boots. They were rocking chacos, okay? Like it's all getting in between their toes, and it's grimy and grungy and sweaty. And just feet in general, are, even if they're covered by shoes, are gross, right? Like, like I'm covering my feet right now because I've got a gross toenail. I got a picture of it. I'm just kidding. I don't, I'm not going to show it to you, but it is true. I do have a gross one. Because feet are gross, right? And in this particular case, these gross feet were messing up the meal. These guys didn't have their feet tucked under chairs with, you know, a nice table and a fine linen tablecloth. They were, they were at a very low table that would have had pillows all around it, and they would have been kind of what, what they would call reclining. They would have been leaning in perhaps on their, their left elbow so that they could eat with their right hand. And those of you who are left-handed, you know, just we're screwing everything up, you know, because we're trying to go the other way. Their feet are tucked behind them, trying to get them as far away as possible, and none of these feet had been washed. Usually, if you were a guest in someone's home, the host would at least provide a basin and some water for you to wash your own feet. If the host had means, perhaps there would be a servant there who would wash your feet for you. Because foot washing is for slaves, not masters. So why is Jesus getting up from the table? Why hadn't these guys washed their own funky feet? And better yet, why hadn't anyone washed Jesus' feet? Well, I think we're actually given a hint in Luke's gospel. Luke 22, verse 24. Luke sets this up right around the same time as this final meal with Jesus and his disciples. And he writes, a dispute arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. They're arguing about who's the best. You know, they're already talking org chart and, and you know, all kinds of things as it relates to Jesus' kingdom when he finally takes the throne. And Jesus hears them talking about all this. And he says to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who's the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? 
Jesus is just pointing out that this is how the, the world operates. This is the culture that you guys and that we are living in. You know, you would just assume that the greater person is at the table while the lesser person is the one serving. But I, Jesus said, am among you as the one who serves. It's the world's culture clashing with the gospel's culture. And this is conjecture right here. I'm just going to admit on the front end. But, but I'm wondering if because of the way Luke positions this in his gospel and the way John is describing what's going on at this dinner, I wonder if perhaps the disciples had been having that argument that very day had been talking about who was going to have the, the positions in Jesus' kingdom. We know from another gospel account that James and John had pulled Jesus aside and was like, hey, listen, Jesus, when you, you sit on your throne, we'll take the right and the left positions. You know, we'll be your vice kings or whatever that looks like. We know that they were already trying to position themselves in that way. They must have created some tension there among all of them. And so you just start to imagine that this is what's going on in their minds. They're thinking about this, and I can't believe that guy would say that. Why would they do that? And, and, and just like, what's it going to be like for me, you know, when this happens? And, and then they just, they kind of storm right into dinner at the upper room, and they walk right past the basin in the water that's been set out for people to wash their feet. And there's no way they're going to wash one another's feet. No wonder it was left to Jesus. As one theologian wrote, these guys were ready to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. So now you can imagine the shock in the room when Jesus gets up from the table. When he takes off his robe, his robe would have been a symbol that he was a rabbi, he was a teacher. People would have recognized based on the robe that he wore that he was a teacher, a master. He took that off and he picked up a towel which was a symbol of a servant. And he tied it around his waist. And he got down on his knees. And you can just imagine that the room sort of falls awkwardly silent. Like you can hear every drop of water coming off that towel as Jesus wipes the dirty feet of Thomas who would doubt him Peter who would deny him Judas who would betray him verse 12 when he had finished and washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? To which we would imagine the disciples at this point are like, we don't, we don't ever understand Jesus. We, we just never seem to get it. So Jesus answers his own question. Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. I am Lord. I am master, I am teacher and rabbi. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. In other words, Jesus is saying to these guys, guys, if you ever wonder, you know, who's gonna do that? Guys, if you ever wonder whose job it is to get on the floor and do the dirty work, if you ever wonder, like, how do I lead when everyone's looking to me? Or, or what should I do with all the authority and the influence and the resources and the abilities that have been given to me? He says, if you ever wonder, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. What did Jesus do? Well, he leveraged everything he had to serve everyone around him. He leveraged everything he had to serve everyone around him. 
Why did Jesus do this? I mean, why were the hands that, you know, scooped up mud and then gave sight to a blind man, why were they washing feet? Why were the hands that had healed so many sick people and brought the dead back to life, washing dirty scum off the bottom of these men's feet? Well, if we just think spiritually for a second, the hands who created the universe are washing dirty feet because that's what he came to do. To cleanse dirty, broken people from sin. To wipe away the stain of sin and disobedience and rebellion and brokenness and hopelessness. To set people free Deliver us from evil. That's what he came to do. That's what this is symbolizing here in this moment. But really practically, you know, like what, what was helping Jesus get down on the floor and, and do all of this? I mean, he saw a need and he just stepped into it, even though he was God. God in the flesh, the most powerful man in the world. What would help him get down on the floor and do this? Well, think about what had dawned on Jesus as he had first sat down with these guys. He knew he had come from the Father. He knew who he was. He knew he had been given all the authority, all the power and the resources that he needed by God. And he knew that one day he would be with the Father again. Which means the humility to serve flows out of your relationship with God. Jesus was able to do this because he knew all those things. He was confident in all those things, what he believed to be true. And so he lived it out. See, when you know who you are, when you know whose you are, when you know who you belong to, when you know that the ultimate outcome is going to be eternity where you're gonna be with your heavenly father and there won't be any more tears or pain or embarrassment. There won't be any more pride or narcissism or performing for everyone. When you know that, you know you've got nothing to prove and nothing to lose. And so you humbly serve Others, just as Jesus has served you. You're free to put everyone's needs ahead of your own. And we're talking about this, this part of of our culture here, how we do life together at Two Rivers Church, because this is who we want to be. And all week I've been sensing the Spirit of God just just nudging me, prompting to tell you this. This is who you are. I think Two Rivers Church is this. I believe that God, God sees it and he is pleased. The reality is you all work really hard around here. It takes a lot of work to take this place and transform it from a school into a place where we can worship. Classrooms that have tables and desks into places where kids can, can learn more about Jesus and play and have fun at church. It takes a lot of work to do this and a lot of people to do it. People that could be doing so many other things, like sleeping. I was reminded as I was thinking about that this, this week, there was a, a, a Sunday, and I don't remember when, it was several years ago, but um, we were all gathered here, the worship team, the tech team, some people that come to pray, we all gather right here, and we just invite God to come and be a part of this, because we know that if he's not here, then it doesn't matter. And so we're praying for you as you come to this place, we're praying for God to come and to meet us here, and, and we, we come to this realization, someone comes in and tells us, hey, I don't know if you've noticed, but the bathrooms down here that everyone's going to use 
are a disaster area. Like, you know, elementary kids have used the bathroom, like all of it, you know, and, and it's gross, and, then, and people are going to be coming in in a minute. And so all of a sudden, all these, all these skilled musicians and trained technicians who had a job to do, who had already been there for an hour and a half, uh, preparing for the thing that they need to do up here, got up in the middle of that prayer meeting, and they went and grabbed mops and rags and paper towels, and they wiped down toilets. Because that's just what you do. It's who you are, living out the gospel. That's gospel culture. I see it in our groups. I, I, I've heard about moms who've got their own child on their hips while they're stirring a meal on the stovetop, cooking a meal for another mom who may have just had a child or has a sick child. I mean, it's just like, it's crazy. You guys are having all the babies. And, and Megan and Winsley Destiny, our student ministry director, he, they just had their baby, uh, what, two nights ago, I think? So we're celebrating that. Our office manager, Katie Dees, and her husband, David, they just had their baby like a week ago. So there's babies everywhere, and who's going to care for all these folks? You are. You're doing it. It's happening. You are serving others as Christ has served you, and it's Now, this is not a bait and switch, and I'm going to sound very opportunistic here, but I do want to tell you about a need, because I know this is who you are, and by the way, if you're new around here, this is what we're inviting you into. This is, this is who we want to be, and so um, as you come around and, and, and sort of scope this place out and wonder, is there a place for me, then come on in, but this is who we are. This is who we want to be, folks that serve one another as Christ has served us, and so here's a need. As Chris mentioned earlier, there's 75, 80 people who are on the schedule uh, throughout the month to love on your kids back there in those classrooms, to, to teach them about Jesus, to get on the floor with them and read books to them and feed goldfish crackers to them and, and love them and sing with them and play with them. And they do that on a Sunday for three hours, two different services. And then at the end of that time, as all the children are picked up, they turn around and start cleaning it up. And then they start tearing down all the play panels and the padded mats on the floor and put all the toys away in bins. And then, then they grab all the desks and the chairs that belong to the school and they start to look at pictures and set everything back up the way the teachers had it set up. And what I'm inviting you to do today is to sign up to join the teardown team so that we have more people on that team who can go back there and release those saints that have been with your kids all day and, and clean it up for them. That's what I'm inviting you to do. You can, you can just come and let us know. You can drop off a connection card in the giving box or at the info table. If that's, if that's you and you want to sign up for that, it'll just take a little bit of extra time after we kind of you know, put our chairs away in here. You'll be on a team that rotates. It's just a way we can serve one another. They are serving us in such incredible ways. You can serve them as Christ has served you. This is life together. Leveraging everything we have for the good of everyone around us. It's no one saying, do you know who I am? We're saying, I know who I am. I am so loved that God sacrificed his son for me. I have the power and the resources and the strength of the Holy Spirit within me. I'm going to go to heaven and be with him for eternity. So I am free to sacrifice. I'm free to put myself at the end of the line. I'm free to serve you because Christ has served And while we are doing this as a family, we can still grow in this. I can still grow in this. Just this week, I had a crazy situation where I watched someone walk into a restaurant 
and, uh, and totally interrupt me while I was speaking to the host at the host stand about a table and just sort of demanded a table and then just started walking to it. And I was like, what just happened? Like I was invisible. Like, like am I invisible? You know? And, and I was just telling my wife about that uh, and just how crazy that was and how selfish that person was and just so narcissistic of them to do that. And then like five minutes later, I'm telling my wife about something that I shouldn't have to do at the office. I mean, don't they know who I am, you know, and all, all the things that I have on my plate? And that's like, all of a sudden, God was like, he's like, he took a mirror and he was like, and I was like, I sound like that woman at the restaurant, you know, like that's called narcissism, you know? And like all of a sudden I realized I can grow in this. So how do we grow in this? Three quick things. These are, this will be your so what today. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. I can't even say that without smiling. I know that I'm ripping that off of Coach Taylor in Friday Night Lights. And I don't care because it's awesome and it's football season, baby. Can I get an amen? That's right. But for real, try this on this week. Clear eyes. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, we were reading from this earlier. It says in verse 4, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What would it look like if we were to take our eyes off of our pile? And I know there's a pile. I got a ton of stuff on my plate. I know you do too. But what if we began to, to take our eyes off of that and start to look around with eyes that are anticipating opportunities that God will provide to serve other people as Christ has served us? Walk through your home with clear eyes, down the hall at work, or at school, clear eyes to see people as opportunities and not obstacles. Full hearts. Paul said in verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's saying you already have the mind of Christ in you. If you are a believer, you have embraced the free gift of grace and Jesus' payment on the cross for your sin. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And as you learn more about him and what he's called you to do, your heart fills up and begins to overflow. And when you do that, you can't lose. Nothing to prove, nothing to lose. God exalted Jesus who served us all the way to the cross. God set him at a place of honor and exalted him. And that's what's in store for us one day. We know we're gonna be with him forever. So we're free to sacrifice and to serve. If Jesus is calling us into this, there must be life in it. If Jesus is calling us into this, there must be joy and freedom in it. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose.